If Russia keeps struggling in Ukraine, there might be a loss of prestige. If Russia keeps showing external weakness and internal instability, this might in the long run have an impact on Russia's appeal in Africa. And that leaves some space for other actors, such as China, Turkey, but also a space for the West to try new types of cooperation in the continent. Hi, I am Matthew Droin, a visiting fellow for the Europe, Russia and Eurasia program, and I'm here to talk about my recent report with Tina Dolbaya, post prigozhin Russia in Africa, regaining or losing control. So why do we ask this question? Because over the past decade, Russia has been consistently gaining ground in Africa, including some spectacular breakthroughs in countries such as Central African Republic, Libya or Mali, establishing itself as a key or even the key partner of local authorities, generally in a deliberate attempt to dislodge the Western partners of these countries. And these breakthroughs, Russia owes them mainly to one man, Evgeny Prigozhin, who until recently led the Wagner Group, a private military company. So we've heard a lot about Wagner and Prigozhin these past few months, maybe not so much because of their African activities, but because of their involvement in the war in Ukraine, where their role has evolved from supplementing the Russian armed forces to actually overtly challenging the Ministry of Defense and ultimately leading to a mutiny in June, which finally stopped at the doors of Moscow, but ended up in the elimination of Prigozhin in late August. So of course, this raises a lot of questions for Wagner and Prigozhin activities in Africa and how the vacuum will be filled. Will the foundation laid by Wagner collapse or will it morph into something different? Will the Kremlin manage to take over? Does it have the resources to allocate while already struggling in Ukraine? And perhaps more crucially is what impact will it have on African perception and eagerness to partner with Russia? So with these questions in mind, perhaps two takeaways from our report. First is that Wagner seems to be in a high draw mode in the sense that we see a lot of new heads appearing since the main head has been cut, ranging from Prigozhin and Wagner inner circles and the current command structure to people closer to the Kremlin and to the Ministry of Defense, such as the people from the GRU, the Military Intelligence Service. But despite the changes in the command and control, our assumption is that the main operational structure seems to be here to remain, just being more tightly controlled by the Kremlin. And the second takeaway is that it doesn't seem so far to have a major impact on Russia's appeal on the African continent. Just look, for instance, at the coup in Niger, where you could see Russian flags being waved, perhaps not so spontaneous, but at least it shows that Russia still has the ability to carry out major influence operations in the continent. We think that this influence is here to stay perhaps for two reasons. First, that the Russian narrative challenging the current international order still resonates in parts of Africa. And second, that the security package offered by Wagner, that we call regime survival packages, are still attractive to authorities and they are able to convince public opinion through these information campaigns. So this is not set in stone. Of course, if Russia keeps struggling in Ukraine, there might be a loss of prestige. If Russia keeps showing external weakness and internal instability, this might in the long run have an impact on Russia's appeal on the continent. And that leaves some space for other actors, such as China, Turkey, but also a space for the West to try new types of cooperation in the continent. And this is also something that we explore in the report. To read the full report, post-Prigozhin Russia in Africa, regaining or losing control, please visit csis.org.